we all have that one workbook which has tons of calculations and when it comes to handing it over we just don't want to go near it or in some cases maybe you pick up a workbook that your colleague has built and you discover they've written hundreds of calculations half of them maybe for formatting reasons and you need to decipher them because someone's asked for a pretty critical change to a workbook that you maintain. Now, that would be a daunting task, but in today's video, I talked to Ana Rey de Castro. She's built a really nice tool that can actually give you some lineage for your calculations. And it does this all on device. There's no cloud service uh, required. It's free. She's got the code on GitHub. And in this video, I had a conversation with her about the origin of the tool, the use cases that she sort of came up against that prompted her to build this tool. And then we went through three scenarios. We used a simple workbook that I'd built. We used a more complex one. And then we pulled out one of Andy Kriebel's book of calculations and we went into that. And I'll tell you, it was complex. So in this video, um, we talked through the whole entire process. Um, I think Anna's got a really interesting perspective on what it feels like to be on the ground in an analytic setup. Um, she shares some you know, personal context to that and also some inspiration for maybe other people who are thinking of building tools themselves to solve problems they come up against all the time. As ever, let's get stuck in. Anna, how are you doing? Hey Tim, how are you? Excited. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited. I think um, we've been talking for the last you know, couple of months uh, about uh, the work you've been doing with this lineage tool. We'll come on to it very shortly. But I think I've been keen to get you on because I'm really intrigued about the way you've built it. So we'll we'll absolutely we'll absolutely get stuck into that. Um, but I think it's probably good to start with an introduction of yourself um, to the Tableau community, tell people who you are and uh, what you do. Sure. So thank you for having me. And um, well, I guess no worries. quick introduction. Um, I used to be a chemist, but I realized I didn't like to work in laboratories because I'm a very right. extroverted person. So I needed some more like dynamic interactions in my life that made me go into <laughs> um, a grad scheme, which I found when I lived in London um, in banking. And that actually got me into software development because I was like in right. the realm there. And once I was there, I took some courses on Python data analysis and saw that data was like the currency of right. the future. And I said, like, right. if I don't want to ever go into a situation which I had before, when once I finished chemistry, I saw that I, my career options were very limited. I said, no, I'm mm -hmm. going to go to the opposite, open up my horizon. So I'm going to go into data. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So that took me into, well, <laughs> Tableau, which I eventually found. Um, but ever since I've been doing like also like SQL and Python, automating workflows wherever I could. Um, yeah. And since I left my last job, now I'm doing a new one where I'm working with DBT and Snowflake. Um, our visualization tools are not Tableau anymore, which I terribly okay. miss um okay we'll talk about that we'll talk about that so for full context we, we've been chatting a bit before this call and i think technology has been transpiring against us right like for the last 45 minutes so um yeah we're all good i've muted my phone your computer's working i think nothing else is going to cause us any trouble um but yes you were saying um chemist uh banking and then uh, now you don't do work with Tableau as much. You're working a bit more with DBT. Uh, what is your visualization sort of uh, choice, by the way, at the moment then? Choice? Not your choice. My choice, choice but, uh, is Tableau. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been very popular about that. Your tool of choice is Tableau. Um, Fine. But what, what, do you, what do you have to use then? So say that way. we've been using uh, Periscope for a bit. It's like size Periscope. Okay. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is okay. Like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. But... Now yeah. we're, we're actually migrating into Sigma. So I'm a bit okay. new with that. Oh, interesting. Um, I just did a video with Katrina Mene on that um, literally two weeks ago. So we went through Sigma versus Tableau. Mm. Um, so definitely check her out because she wrote the book on... So it's a phrase I hear all the time from my colleagues, but she actually wrote a book about Sigma. Um, so she she did a great session about the difference in between Sigma and Tableau. We spent about two hours talking about it. So that I'm just I'm pitching that episode because I think if you're just about to move to Sigma, that will be great context. But I actually think that's good because I think it does bring you closer to something a bit more modern. It sounds like Peris Periscope wasn't as modern, if that makes sense. No. no? <laughs> 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 so, no no okay fine fine so then um 
let's go back to let's go back to um you know the tools that you're using today you mentioned dbt snowflake and then periscope for visualization yeah. are those the only things you're using are uh, python and r or are those sort of part of your sort of tool set or maybe Not they're just personal moment, skills because of how my my current team is structured so i'm more like right. the senior finance uh data analyst side. So I'm just basically yeah. doing everything from like getting the stakeholders requirements and then seeing yeah. the data that we have, but all the ETLs, EOTs actually now, um, and data pipelines and data jobs automation are done by the engineers. So they are the ones yeah. that actually look after that part. Okay, that's just a really interesting team structure as well, because the engineers suggest that you have like a centralized data engineering capability and then you have a separate maybe uh, distributed analysis setup so you have centralized data engineers but distributed like visualization and analysts within the different teams is that am i reading too much into that or is that uh, can you even share i know sometimes if you work in finance you can't even share these things so uh, don't reveal anything you can't but yeah <laughs> when i worked in finance there was more that we couldn't share than we could so it was yeah, very fine, constrained. Fine, we'll keep it at that. <laughs> um, at the moment, I don't really know how much I can share because it's a new team for me. That's fine. Too. That's fine, 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 fine. No worries. But yeah, no, for, for everyone's context, I think it's really important to like, you know, if you've only ever worked with Tableau, you've likely worked in either a centralized team that delivers Tableau assets to the whole organization, or you've worked in decentralized teams where you have an individual within a business unit who delivers work for that business unit. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple people like that spread across the business. Those tend to be the two models. But in more recent times with data engineers and people who work on the warehouse, um, you get this sort of um, slightly different model where you have some parts centralized and some parts decentralized. And it's with a view to, to try and help an organization, you know, you know, have this, I hate this term so much, single version of the truth. Uh, the, the, the thing I hate about that phrase is that it assumes that everyone sees things the same way, right? Like, and it's just not true. <laughs> I can, I can if we all had the same pair of, if we all had the same pair of glasses and eyes, yes, of course, single version of the truth works, but that's just not the reality. So anyway, I digress. I'm, I'm taking up your air time. I'm sort of back, back to you here now. So, um, Okay, you're working for a team, you're building these tools, you're on your way to Sigma. Um, I think it would be good then to sort of go back to the tool that you have built and sort of ask you a bit more about like what led you to want to build it um, as a context. Then we'll talk more a bit about sort of what it is and how it works. Sure, so basically uh, maybe like three years back, I was working with this woman that I admire so much and I think she's one of the fastest and most like smartest minds I've seen in my life yeah. and so she was a product manager we were trying to monitor the success of an internal program we were running and the yeah. way that she told me Anna this is everything you have to monitor and I was like okay fine let me see we've got the data uh, okay we've got x and y data sources I'll just like mix them up join them here and there blah blah, blah. then okay this is the dashboard that we're going to build uh, according to like the metrics you want and the metrics that I think should be there perfect like MVP yeah. done and then nice. three months down the line, Anna, we have actually included new functionalities now and this and that and what, <laughs> what was measured before should actually now be measured in, in this and this and this way. And then now we should integrate this. And then if there's a sheep down the mountain and the sheep's farmer's name is John, then we should also integrate an LOD into the calculation. <laughs> Okay, let's do this. And That's so, a lot of logic, yeah. I was like, okay, fine. Let me go through all the calculations I had created because some impacted others. And then there was a new definition of like one of the first ones that was an LOD that then was impacting others. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'm going to get, um, I opened up Tableau and I got, um, you know, like the snipping tool. And I did yeah. screenshots of all my calculations and then I pasted them all in like a Visio diagram so that I could yeah. then start creating arrows and then oh, I started smart. color coding yeah. everything, adding like borders yeah, yeah. and then some icons because sometimes we're measuring things um, fixed to the user or fixed to the product or fixed to a segment. And there right. were so many things going on at the same time that it just like exploded. And then a couple of months down the line, they were like, Anna, what? There's another functionality that we need to now like also include. <laughs> like, you're, you're like, you're kidding me. So 
I said like, okay, I can go again and take screenshots of everything and then update everything again. But this is going to get out of hand if we're going to continue doing like agile right. uh, development. Yeah. So then I said like, there should yeah. be an easier way. And I was uh, thinking, you know how like basically everything we have in a computer, a file is like, it's basically metadata that a program or a software is going to interpret in such a way. So I said like, the calculations yeah. that I'm doing must be there somewhere. So that led me yeah. to my first blog post on my on my blog, which is if you had a um, packaged workbook and you unzip it, then you're going to get yeah. the TWB file, which you can yeah. read as an XML file. And then you're going to have all the metadata. So I started like scraping the XML, parsing it, right. um, getting all the calculated yeah. fields. And then I extracted them into a... PDF, well, into a data frame in Python, which then I also printed yeah. out into an Excel and then into a PDF. And I said, okay, now all my documentation is here, done. So I have all my formulas in one place. And then I could also run this and keep it as backups. So if I ever wanted to go into any place nice. in the, like in the, uh, sorry, in, in the past, in to the see like, why was I measuring this in such a way? Because the other thing I usually do is I add comments onto my formulas because sometimes, and okay, the very smart woman right. is called Alice. So I'm also going to share this video with her, but I, like, I would say, Alice, why do we want this? Oh yeah, we have to include this because X and Y and Z and okay, <laughs> fine, no worries. That is my comment. So everything got like extracted into a PDF and that was gold. Yeah. For me. Right. Down the line, I, I was talking to someone who did uh, more Tableau on the like on the Tableau server side, and they said, "Well, you know, there is a, yeah. there's a metadata API and also a Tableau document API, yeah. which will already get you all the formulas." Um, so I yeah. changed my code. So instead of me parsing the XML, I would just like reuse the functions from the Tableau document API. But basically, yeah. the functionality was still the same: just getting the fields, uh, putting them all into like a table structure, data frame structure. Yeah. But then that didn't give me the visual um, like end to end or the map of all the formulas and how they fed into each other, which I had been doing by like copy pasting <laughs> and doing arrows. Right. So I yeah, remember yeah. <laughs> that once someone at one of my previous roles, they were using mermaid diagrams to create such work. Yeah. So I was like, what if we just like all the information that we have, we just need to analyze and see which calculation is apparent of which and then we can just like i don't know create a bit more code to which is going them. to analyze this yeah. and then dump it into a mermaid diagram that is your lineage yeah. diagram and yeah, yeah that is what i added as the latest um iteration of my code and that's what we are yeah. discussing now amazing amazing so much so much detail there um, I'm going to go back and right from the beginning, like little bits that you said, and I'm going to try and make sure that everyone sort of understands them. So Microsoft Visio, I think is a tool you're talking about. That's like a diagram and flow charting tool, right? Yeah. And I think Visio doesn't come with Office 365 for anyone who's looking at their computer and going, where's Microsoft Visio? It doesn't come with Office 365 if you're just, you know, on your personal machine, but it does tend to come with the business plan for Microsoft 365, I think. And therefore, people tend to have it in their work machines um, installed. And so it's a really good tool, not just for flow diagrams, but I think it does entity relationship diagrams as well really well. And it, it lets you do all these sort of data and infrastructure uh, capabilities. But something like Draw.io, or I use this Scally Draw as an example, could do the same thing. I think Visio is just a little bit more professional and it has all this stuff sort of laid up nicely, which is kind of good. Um, to be fair, and then, you can do it on uh, PowerPoint also, or even on page. Exactly, exactly. You just open up PowerPoint and copy and paste. You, dare I say you could do it in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> it just won't look as good. No, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could try. <laughs> no, absolutely. And then the, the other thing is um, the API. So yes, there's, there's, there's actually two APIs you mentioned, but I think you meant... Um, the document API is the main one because the document API looks at the workbook, yeah. right? And the XML of the workbook. And that's supported by Tableau. It's actually designed by Tableau to help you get into the workbook and extract the XML. But when you go to the server, uh, specifically Tableau Server or Tableau Cloud, the metadata API allows you to query what's on the server. So in that instance, you can say, hey, 
go to this workbook and show me all the upstream and downstream metadata related to it. So that could be connections, it could be calculations downstream, it could even be show me everyone who has a data source uh, that's been created based on this data source and share me all their emails. It's sort of really, really complex. So um, it's, it's interesting as you talk through your sort of journey of discovery because you were essentially kind of talking your way through the Tableau platform in lots of different ways. And I think it's it's really, not many people know about all these sort of what I'd say corners of Tableau, right? So document API, not many people have come across that. Your little trick of uh, right click unzipping the workbook and then getting the data folder, the TWB, and all the other stuff. That is some stuff that I think everyone should just try and do because it might open your eyes to the way Tableau works. And you can do it with Tableau Prep as well. The Tableau Prep package flow does exactly the same thing. So it's just XML, you've got your data and you can you can essentially pick it apart. And for that, you could, <laughs> I'm sure someone has done this. I think Jar Jared Flores has built a tool that turns a prep flow into SQL for you, which is kind of powerful using the same sort of logic. So it's really, really mind blowing. I, I keep meaning to ping him uh, and say, hey, Jared, come and talk to me about this. If Jared, if you're watching this and I haven't pinged you yet, <laughs> get in touch. <laughs> so yes, um, so much you covered there. I th thank you so, for so much for going into it in detail. Um, I think I think it's before I, before I sort of we talk about it a bit more, I noticed you said that you work a bit with DBT. Did that inspire any of this in, in, in some way? Is there something in DBT that you're like, oh, I really like that and I wanted to bring it into the sort of the world of Tableau? Or actually, is this completely separate, if that makes sense? Like, they are sort of like twin brothers. Have you watched that film with Lindsay Lohan in which they were twins <laughs> and they didn't know because they were separated before and then they found each other? So <laughs> yeah. I hadn't ever worked with DBT until this year. so. Like when I voted right. for this, I didn't even exit new. Right, the, uh, right. New so yeah, yeah, makes sense. But now like this year that I'm working with DBT, it does have the lineage. So like when you're creating the models, it will tell you like the lineage of, oh, this model is getting this data from this source and this and this intermediate model and so on. And it's super useful. Um, again, from what we were discussing uh, previous to like starting to record, but like if you want to debug one part of the code instead of like, like, like you can break your code into smaller chunks that are more Small easy to chunks. manage and yeah. then you can like see the flow yeah. and then if something breaks down the line then you already know like which part you can isolate and test again and yeah 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 exactly and i i think it's it's fantastic when you were building this. i should have picked up on that context because you you did message me a while back about about this project and I know, I know i know the project hasn't taken that amount of time it's more that it's more that you've sort of done it in bits uh, throughout your journey and so it's fascinating that you've you you kind of started down this route and then you started working with something at a different end of the pipeline you know the very beginning of the data sources that kind of does this is there any part of you that wishes um, you could bring some of what you've done more easily into the Tableau platform and vice versa? For example, you've got your lineage tool, you're able to sort of break out this, um, this let's say, Merbay diagram, which we'll see in a second. Is there any part of you that wishes, ah, oh, I want to be able to click on that field, click on that field, and now do something with it, if that makes sense, and have that change go back to the workbook? Yeah, completely. Like I don't know if I can show the diagram now because then maybe it'll be more visual, but so it'll break the context. Fine. Let's, let's, let, let, let's let you show the tool. Cause I think I'm spoiling it by t like jumping ahead here. So, um, yeah, let me, let me give you the floor. Let, let me let you sort of start screen sharing and show us what it does. And then we'll put that, we'll put a pin in that question. We'll come back to it. Cool. <laughs> Good. So yeah, over to you. I think you're screen sharing already, so we can we can just focus on that. So um, the way I can start showing you this, maybe let me just make this bigger, is that I'm working with a very 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 simple um, workbook that I created for well, this mm -hmm. purpose, and this is going to read from an airline CSV. I just got any yep. random data source to be fair, because I wanted to create a couple of calculated fields that don't really mean much from the business perspective, but I just wanted to like create them so we can follow the yeah. lineage. So see some context, yeah. Yeah. Imagine for example, that we have, I don't know, like an airport name and from that airport name. So if I'm like adding the airport name here, 
you'll see that that airport name actually has a concatenated Atlanta GA, so like the city right. and the city code yeah. and then the actual airport name. So I said, what if I can just get the airport city out of that? So how am I going to get that? I'm just going to create a calculated field, which is going to be a split the airport name and get the second bit. Yeah. Um, and then mm -hmm. I did the same for the state. So once I already had the city, the city was still coming with the code also. So I did the same and then I split it again and got the second bit. So now we have the state as a code. And so then I said, okay, now I'm going to do something that doesn't really mean anything, but let's concatenate the year because we have a year, um, the time of year, and then let's just concatenate that against the uh, state. So we have the concat yeah. year. And this is basically, again, a concatenated of the time year plus the state, where I'm defining the time year as a string, because otherwise it wouldn't let us do that, because it's like an integer. So yeah. now, imagining that this weren't a such a simple workbook, but it was like a more complicated one, and we at some point lost track of what is feeding into what. I wanted to be able yeah. to follow all my calculations, the ones I've been just like referring nice. to but in a more visual way. So what we were talking before is that I created this code that, to be fair, the first thing it would do, and that was the original way uh, this was created, was that it would list all my field names that were coming from my default uh, data source, in this case, the airline's data source. And this is where right. the Tableau document API comes uh, into play. And then it yep. will just tell me, okay, what's the data type? Um, is it a default field? What's the actual real field ID that we don't necessarily see because that's more in the back right. end? Yeah. And then, you do need that when you're in Tableau Server. Sorry? <laughs> right. You do need the actual calculation name field uh, when you're doing things with filters in Tableau Server. So that's really useful to have. Yeah. Well, you also need it. I didn't know that, but you also need it because like any calculation you create is going to be assign a name like this calculation exactly. one one blah 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 but when yeah, yeah, you look exactly. at the xml any calculation is going to include the real names like the field ids so what i had to do yes. is like then go around the actual calculations and then swap them for the more like user-friendly name yes exactly yeah <laughs> yeah but then that's exactly what we have now here so for example what i was showing you before like the um concat year city so if we click on edit and then we see okay that's the formula um, now we have it also here. Yeah. So Concord Year City is just the string of the time year plus the state. Nice. Um, so now we basically have everything in one go. And I just realized now that we're talking that this workbook that I opened is not the same as the one that created that PDF because that workbook actually, like the PDF has a comment. A comment above it. But that's yeah. the nice thing about like the code. You can add any comment um, where you want to like add some notes for your business logic or anything. And that is also going to get... Yeah output it into put into the into yeah. the diagram sorry into the pdf but as the pdf stands it wouldn't necessarily give me the lineage so from here i would have to say okay wait concord year city um sorry right. yeah it's getting the state but what does what is the state getting oh it's getting, getting the airport city but the airport city is getting the airport name ah alas finally that's like a default field <laughs> so instead of going backwards like that i said like why can't we just have a simple way to see this, which is basically this. So um, my mermaid diagram or the lineage diagram is going to color anything that is in pink is going to be a default yeah. field that comes from your data source, any of the ones that you use it. Uh, I see, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything else is just like a calculated field. So like here we see, as we were seeing before, that Conca year city is using state. So now we can also see that state has been used, but state was already getting the city, which was actually depending on the airport name. So maybe and assuming that you want to refresh your data uh, a month from now, and then you see that everything that has conquered year city is failing, every dashboard or every sheet, then yeah. that can already give you an indication that it might be that within your data source, either the time year uh, field has been corrupted or it could also be the airport name. So that also in a way that you follow any errors and help you debug or diagnose anything that has gone wrong on your data source. Yeah, it's, it's super powerful because, um, you know, while, you, while you're talking, I'm also thinking like, 
uh, we'll come onto the way this works in a second, but this is this is so useful if you've got. Um, sometimes uh, people are working with a large number of workbooks. You could be doing a migration, let's say, from Tableau Server to Tableau Cloud. And in the process of doing that, you're trying to rationalize your data sources so that you can, for example, build all the uh, data sources really well in Snowflake, right, as a, as a very simple example. So what you might do is you might grab 50 workbooks all at once uh, that are using a specific uh, data source. And then you'll want to see the field and just being able to see, okay, look, um, this field on that on on that data source is coming natively from that allows you to look at this diagram and say okay we need to make sure those are at the very minimum already there mm. and then you can sort of build up your intelligence from there and it's a really quick way of doing that especially not just for one workbook but um, you can run this on multiple workbooks um, fairly quickly and it's 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 a really I think it's a good way of approaching the problem and it's um, it's a no frills. It's, it doesn't need any sort of fancy lineage capability from Tableau, right? Like you've just you've just built something straightforward, uh, does a job, and it's going to answer ninety percent of the things you want it to answer because you build workbooks and so you've built it in a way that answers the questions you need to answer, which is perfect. So yeah. Thank you. Really, really good. Yeah, and so nice. I wanted to come back to the question that we pinned uh, a while ago. Yes. Because yes, you said like, yes. is there anything Mermaid that you'd like? Yeah. Tableau to also have or that they could build within yeah. their product. So for me, like at the moment, and I fully understand that, of course, like everyone who creates a Tableau must like be already working in a lot of things. But at the moment, you all, every time you want to create a calculation, yeah, you can go there and create like edit or create. And I know that, for example, one like little trick is that you can just drag and drop um, your yeah. fields and then it'll help you create something. Or you can duplicate and and done. But if we had the capability of having something like that looks this visual and that you can just click here on the right click and edit, and then you're always going to have your lineage. And what if like even you could have a tool oh, tip that shows you like the the actual formula? Because right now on the yeah. Con Concord Year City, like we know the dependencies in terms of fields, but we are not seeing the formula like per se. You're not seeing the, the detail. Yeah, yeah. Like the way That's for me to see the yeah. formula is I also need my PDF and then here I can check and say, oh, okay, yeah, it's got like a string. Um, but like just the diagram won't tell me like the whole picture. Like what if I want to know if yeah. any of these things has an LOD? Um, what if yeah. I wanted to know if they have a fixed rather than a, an include? Um, I wanted things to come in a different color or just like, you know, like we are going into the I, well, we're already in the 21st century, but 21st like, century. Yeah, we have like, <laughs> <laughs> we have like, but I mean, like, technology is ever advancing. And yeah, no, I get to you. a point in which we can just like drag, drop, and it's, instead of the normal UI, we can do things in a, in a quicker way. Then why not? So I'm I'm sitting here with bated breath, about to tell you that you're going to love Sigma for this very reason because it it has this. It has this right out of the gate, and it doesn't just have it for calculations. It has it for everything. So it has it for filters. So, for example, you'd see a filter in here, and you'd see all the different sheets that it affects. Uh, you'd see sheets in here. You'd see calculations in here. You could see literally everything that you're building inside of Figma in this in this layout. And it's just it's part of it's just native. You just get it out of the box. Everything you're doing has this in the background. So. Um, when you get to start to use Sigma more, you're gonna you're gonna absolutely love this, and you're absolutely right. Tableau should give you this view. It's a it's a much richer perspective. It's almost I almost think like this is this is exactly what Tableau Prep is in a way, right? Like imagine if Tableau Prep hadn't been this separate Alteryx like product, which was you know doing flows and, and everything, and actually it was also about data modeling. It allowed you to see a little bit of what you see in the Connect window in Tableau today paired with um, a little bit more detail from lineage that you get in Tableau Cloud and Tableau Server. So bringing all these things in different places into one place. Dare I say it, Tableau might do this with Tableau Einstein, but they probably won't do it with the legacy Tableau. So um, it'd be interesting to see where Tableau goes with that thought. But I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, a modern analytics tool, BI tool, should give you much richer ways to have observability anywhere in the product, whether it's a data source, the worksheet, or 
um, back in Tableau Server or even wherever you you know wherever you do your work as Tableau and Salesforce like to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. So that that is um, pretty. I think that's really powerful. Um, do you have a really messy mermaid diagram you can show us? Because I think the thing that people always critique Tableau with is like, oh, no data source looks like this. This is very simple. This is very neat. Like, show us something really messy. And, and then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's start with mine it's first. Yeah, this is actually a funny conversation we had before. Because um, for, for everyone who's watching uh, Context, you know, Anna went and got some workbooks from my Tableau public profile, right? So um, you went and got one of the visit of the days I had from, I don't know, way back when. What year was this even? I think even? 2016 when, did I... when you published it. Oh, my word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow, 2016, way back when. Um, Donald Trump was running for the election for the first time, can you believe it, um, to become president. So nearly, we are, we are talking, yeah, nearly a well, nearly a decade, about yeah, yeah. eight years ago, which is which is crazy. And um, you pulled this workbook and you ran it through the metadata. And what did you find um, I, the, the, in the well, workbook? Well, my computer actually <laughs> crashed because it couldn't handle. <laughs> couldn't handle this couldn't handle ridiculous this really of the day. <laughs> yeah, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. I. We, so. The actual Sorry, calculations that you like. No, yeah, it's funny. You know, we, we can we can. Yeah, do it. Calculations let's let call me out. Let's see. Let's see what I was doing eight years ago. I can just say up front, whatever whatever awful things we find in here. This was me from eight years ago. I didn't even have a YouTube channel. It's okay. I was still learning. <laughs> no worries. You have. Right, here we go. Here we you go. You have here the two go. calculated fields. Um, well, there was oh, an extra yeah. field. nested windows and lookups. Yeah, yeah. They didn't appear on my diagram. So basically, the number one. Interesting. <laughs> but that yes. number one won't appear. Oh, that's that is a trick, I think. Oh, no, number of records integer calculated field one. Oh no, number of records is the data source that Tableau creates. Sorry, it's the column that oh, I forgot this for a second because it doesn't do this in the data model. But back then. Number of records is a field Tableau creates with the number one, so that um, uh, you can count the number of rows. But when you open it in today's Tableau, it creates this as a calculated field, if that makes sense. Okay. So it doesn't exist. If you back in the day when you created, do you see if you on the left here, yeah. um, there is no number of records anywhere in this new mm. sort of Tableau. They they got rid of it, but back in the day there used to be a number of records item like measure values and ah, measure base so what happens one. is Airline if you open a workbook from back then yeah. correct correct so if you open a workbook from back in the day it creates the calculated field number of records but if you start a brand new workbook today it actually just has the count so yeah okay. yeah okay so good good insight boom <laughs> cool. <laughs> so well, yeah. I, I guess that as we see, um, your two calculations they, they depended on the two other um, uh, yeah. fields, and yeah. that was pretty much very it. simple. Very simple. That's They're very it, nice. Yeah. Like and... the visuals are very nice. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing I was playing with here. If you hover over one of the bars. The thing I was playing with here is the interaction. So when you hover over the top one, do you see how it follows the, yeah. the chart at the bottom? And as you as you move your mouse across, the line follows the chart. And so the way I did this was I used an action to the second sheet. And when you don't hover over a data source, it uses the min and the max, which are just on the very edge of the chart. Mm -hmm. So you don't see them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then as soon as you hover on something above, the min and max are going to match the exact thing you're looking at. And so it ends up highlighting the, the chart below at the exact same point with a line for the min and max, which then draws this line vertically. So when I discovered that, I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like. <laughs> <laughs> how do you remember so well how this works though because sometimes i do build or i like would use a trick and then i don't fully remember like just as fast as you do um i think it's because i spent 
I remember, I, I just remember, you know, one of these things in tablet sometimes when you learn something for the first time and you learn a trick, but the trick is so simple. You can't believe you've never, you've never come across it before. And I came across this by mistake because I was trying to do something else. And I just realized, oh, this trick only works if you fix the axis, basically. Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't fix the axis, then the min and max would always show up on the chart, if that makes sense. So you see how it starts on the 1st of April? If you were to go on the data set and you look at the actual workbook, it would show you that I fixed the start date to the 1st of April. If I fixed it on, let's say, the 30th of March, you would see the reference line hiding just off, 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 off the thing. Mm. And so I fixed it and I was like, oh, my God, this does exactly what, what we want it to do. And then here we are. So <laughs> I should maybe do a video on this now. And I, I bet you like, <laughs> I bet you probably do quite well. But, you know, once you figure these things out, I'm sure you know this. You just move on on to the next problem, right? <laughs> I know. I know. I know the feeling. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But anyway, I have simple workbooks, very simple calculations. I think this calculation, if I try and describe it, ZN... So if I do this backwards, I'm going to try and see if I actually know what this calculation is doing. Uh, so what this calculation is actually doing, it's a moving average, looking back five days. And it's comparing against, for each candidate, basically, it's comparing the, the moving average of whatever I'm tracking. So this is... Um, I think it's approvals and it's showing how much it's like shifting. I'm not so sure about the percentages. The percentages look really wrong to me, like 0.1%. I have been there looks... for just the state, for two states now. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, good, right. Makes way more sense. Oh no, it's still, it's still, it's still really funny percentages. I think they're off by about maybe, I think they're off by about exactly 100 uh, 100x. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think it's missing two zeros. I think it should say 30%, 20%, 10%. Does that make okay. sense? I think something's gone wrong with that. And because you see the bottom, you see the 40, 42, 44. Yeah. And what you're seeing is the delta. So the deltas make more sense if they're in the like 10 to 20% range. So yeah, because the, the delta should match roughly the gaps between the thing. Anyway, I, I digress. Moving averages, that's all they do. I have very simple calculations. So it's not great for your tool because I only have two calculations. <laughs> you were the one who selected this, <laughs> this work. I remember... I, I, I selected it because I thought it was fun and then I realised oh, I, there are literally no calculations. Look how many parameters I've got and look look, look at how they're all like... Um, they're set. So this, this is exactly... Um, a judge's Mexican heritage. Oh, these are the book. These are the... Um, these are the lines that you have these, here. These are the lines, reference lines. Yes, yeah, so I've just baked them in as parameters so they're always there. Mm. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Should have added them to the data source rather than do that. But anyway. Uh, so two calculations, not that useful. <laughs> <laughs> at, least for what you're, at least for what you're doing. But we do have one... Maybe let's go for an intermediate one. Um, yes, let's go for yeah, something more complex. Who, whose workbook is this? I want to say this is an Andy workbook, but... Andy Kribble, yeah, yeah, probably makes sense. But maybe it isn't, then I'm given the wrong credit. Because I know I... Actually, if you just let me... Uh, credit card complaints dashboard. So what if we just like find it? Credit you can just type it in. The search works nowadays. dashboard. <laughs> Hopefully it'll just have a couple. Ah. Oh. No, it has tons because of all they're all part of a makeover Monday or I something. No. <laughs> but I I think I know who it was. It's just that right now, oof, I would have to find it. It's it'll someone take you a while. who's creating very, very nice dashboards. So what if sort by um, recently published view count. Well, recently published will just show you like um, I think you want to sort by um, view count because um, recent well if because that will probably show you which one of these oh interesting 
Oh, that search is now awful because you see it's showing you the COVID dashboard as a, yeah, as yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and that's not even part of the search. I think the search is broken there. So how about like, I know. So it has to be relevant. It's yeah. it's someone who's been creating very like nice colored. And I just like the dashboards that they were creating, but like off the top of my head, I can't remember the name. And we'll yeah. find out. We'll find out. It's either like. There's like three or four people it could be, right? So um, it could be Ellen Blackburn, potentially. Um, it's a guy. She builds lots of very... It is a guy. a guy. Okay, so is it... Um, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, God, this is now where I'm really bad with names. Um, it's bad because I've interviewed them as well already. Um, they, they built some templates. I will find out and I will come back to this video and I'll add it in as like a... <laughs> Thing. Let let me know if you find out who it is. We'll right. add it in yeah. after the fact, but that's Definitely. fine. So they they've got a much more complicated workbook, yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna... yeah. Um, yeah, which you can see from here. So in yes, this case, yes. they're using one, two, three, four, five, mainly five um, default fields, and then I'm gonna yeah. guess that. These P week numbers sold at cost response might be parameters that they're using afterwards because these ones oh, are I not see. depending on any calculated field. But this is something I wanted to also do on my next iteration. So, for example, any parameter can yeah. come up in a different color. At the moment, yeah. I haven't added it yet, but what you can always do is I'll just quickly show you how my um, code. Yeah, how it works, yeah. Yeah, so just before we go on how it works, I'll just show you on Jupyter uh, Notebook how it will output just like the syntax that you need for the mermaid, for the mermaid diagram. Oh, I see. And then you can copy paste that and go into mermaidchart.com, which is an online editor. <laughs> because, right. And this is why I left it as such, because then you could just like bring it over here and then what you can do... Style it, format it. Yeah, and I guess we can also do it from here if I just go into the view page source. Like from here, I can just grab the whole flow chart. It's also there, yeah, yeah. And then I'll just copy paste it. Oh, it's a it. HTML chart. I see, I see. So it's like a JSON array of information and there you go, that's your... Exactly. That's really cool. You... And so Is it possible to... Uh, is it possible to create a link that does this? Like, so... You, you, I guess you're kind of already doing it in the web page, so I've just answered my own question, so never mind. What do you mean as a link? <laughs> oh, so share. you know how, yeah, so this website's pretty cool, right? It's like, it's basically the thing. So what I'm wondering is your tool exports the HTML file, exactly. right? Saves the, it. The, 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 the saves it. But what I'm wondering is what if your tool also created a link that went to this and just put in this specific thing so you could either see it locally, which is great for businesses who want to keep everything secure, or if you wanted to share it, you had the option of getting the link and then being able to put it in an email and send it off. Because this, this is basically, I could copy that syntax and put it in here and it would work. So I'm wondering if this tool allows you to build a special link using that information to kind of um, put it all in here. Anyway, we digress. We get, no we get worries. distracted. So I, <laughs> at the moment, I wouldn't know how because I guess you would need an API to this mermaidchart.com. To this tool, but yeah, or something like that. If yeah. you have a free account like I do, it's only going to let you do yeah. five uh, diagrams. You can't save Calls. anymore. Oh, five diagrams. Okay, yeah. I see, I see. Okay. So it's not unlimited because that's, I guess those are API calls as well. That's so how that's they get to That makes sense. But, but coming back to what I was saying before, so for example, let's assume that P month and P year are actual parameters. So the mm -hmm. cool thing about this editor, and I mean, you can also, okay, wait, I need to get rid of, how do I get rid of, okay. I need to click here and then from the colors, I could decide, okay, all the parameters are now going to be painted in yellow. And then yep. that's going to do that for me. Or you can also like change colors of, lines if you wanted to like the lines and stuff right. show something differently and i guess this is more like on the format side this is not like a deal breaker or like for mvp levels so like minimum viable product what i've done is already mm -hmm. giving you the lineage but if you want to prettify it you can do that here 
Um, yeah. What the reason why my code is only spitting the the default fields as pink is because I already added that um, on the on the definition. So I defined a little class called foo, and anything that is foo, which is going to be a default field, is going to have the stroke with that colors. So you can easy, I can easily also do the same for parameters. If I know anything is a parameter, I can give it a different class with a different color. Yeah. But that is for the next iteration. Or can be done here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is where you take it. Out of interest, why foo? Is there a particular reason? Or is it just like a name you came up with? I tried Tim, <laughs> but it didn't like it. So. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's oh, like, okay. you know, when you work with anything, uh, they always have like John Doe or Jane Doe. So for classes, yeah. they usually yeah. have foo. Yeah, fine. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I was just curious if the, you know, sometimes uh, people leave Easter egg in their code, right? So I'm wondering if that was, that was some sort of like an Easter egg of some sort. Mm -hmm. But anyway, no, it's, uh, it's good. I like it. Foo. Indeed. <laughs> Right, yeah, so this is quite good because you could style this how you want, if that makes sense. Um, if someone's running your code, they could come in here and style it to match their brand colors or whatever, and then suddenly now they've got, you know, they can print out that HTML page as like a PDF, and then they've got it like nicely laid out, and they can add it to the documentation. They could take a screenshot, paste it wherever they need to. So it's really good. Like this this tool with the five uh, diagram limit, it's still going to let you export this as a PNG, SVG, yeah. um, the text as mermaid. Or, yeah, as you said, and we said, like, we can always print it as a PDF, but PNG would yeah. be also great. Yeah. Yeah. SVG is my favorite file format for an image, like at least diagrammed images, because it's uh, basically it's a vector, it's a vector um, image type, which means it's always sharp, which is great if you're looking on, like people have different laptops, different, different screens and I've also realized people have different levels of eyesight. So what is sharp to you might not be sharp to someone else. But with an SVG, everyone is generally seeing the same thing. It doesn't matter like what their vision's like. It's going to be crystal clear to them. So it's good. Good shout. Yeah. And just because we were already talking about like the complexities, um, this one is oh, wow. just... <laughs> Hey, good old, good old Andy. The calculation masterclass the great workbook of what's it called the great book of table calcs um yeah god and then this is the calculation lineage so yeah so, so the context of these books is probably we should give people some context so these books are designed to be templates right for people to be able to go to use and uh, copy you know what comes out of them so i don't know if yeah if you've got the um Andy's got so many visualizations, it's probably not on the first page. <laughs> so it's but kind of annoying. It, it won't let me, like, the prompts. It won't search the whole page because it only it's loads, the, it only loads as you go down. Dynamic loading, yeah. So you'd have to mm -hmm. scroll for like however many visitors he's got and then do the search. I know, yeah. Because so he does I, make over Mondays very, very frequently, you're not going to find it. Yeah, I can ask him tomorrow <laughs> because tomorrow I'm presenting at his. Um, he's got like an online school. For Perfect. Him, so yes. I'll ask him. Yes, 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 it. yes. I wonder if you can also do like when you search. Where is the search? And what is the name of this? Was it author? Um. Oh yeah, the Great Workbook of Table Calcs. Would it come up? Like, it didn't come up before, so... It should come up. Great work. Uh, if, yeah, it should come up. Of Calx, Andy. Ah, there we go. There you go. It's this one. Yeah. <laughs> then someone's else. copied it. <laughs> Cliff <laughs> Beiser's copied it. Indeed. <laughs> Andy will be pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it side to side. But yeah, this is the context that you were giving people. So this is already going to have um formats for lots of different charts and one thing that my code would do before but i removed that uh, functionality because i just didn't think it would add a lot of value but it would tell you the the number of sheets and dashboards that you had in a workbook and also the name of all the sheets but well you can see oh nice 
That adds a ton of value. I would ask for that feature. I would put it back in. <laughs> and maybe I'll put it back yes, in. Yes, because sometimes you open a workbook and you're like, sheet number 253. And you're like, why are there 253 sheets? And then you realize, oh, okay, this is like doing some wizardry where like one dashboard has like 50 sheets and it's swapping them in and out and it's hiding them and stuff like that. So it makes that I, I think it's useful for that reason. But yes, they're all going to be called sheet 253 sheet. People are bad with naming their sheets, so you wouldn't get as much value out of it. I think you're right to say that because you just see a bunch of sheet names. But if people name their sheets accordingly, then actually it would be quite useful. Mm. So, yeah. You would be surprised by the, the names have also seen for the calculations. So they will calc one, calc one, dot one okay. calc one, copy, <laughs> calc one, copy, copy, copy. So <laughs> it also gets like that. But yeah, so yeah. basically, for example, final, this, calc one, final, 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 final. <laughs> real final. <laughs> yeah. I guess Prod. this is <laughs> <laughs> this is the very very big um, amount of calculations that Andy did for the whole workbook. It's massive, I must say. It's like definitely the biggest uh, my code has tackled. But to give a bit more credit to the code, it did it like in under what thirty seconds. So taking into account that my computer is oh, amazing. fully rusted. And it's it's doing all this on device, right? So your code runs on a laptop. It doesn't need any fancy cloud access like Tableau needs these days to do this, which is really, really good. So, yeah. It doesn't. Um, so if you at any point go, I'll share this with you. So you can, oh, this but what I did on the GitHub, because at the moment I just like, share this code. If anyone wants to use it, they can download yeah. it from my repo uh, locally. And then on the readme, you'll find all the steps that they need to install. So now you can also see in like real time how, how yeah, slow dependencies and stuff. But, like that. Um, yeah. yeah, so here it includes yeah. a bit of like the limitations and considerations, like for example, and this is something we realized with Andy, he wanted to run the code himself. And then we realized, oh, actually, it's only a Windows uh, based code because it needs a window, <laughs> I think, or a Microsoft API. Yeah, it's the win32.com client, client yeah. library. So, well, he couldn't run it. So if you've got a Mac, then you already know you can't. But um, if you don't, then it'll tell you how to set up your directory. Because if you ever want to run the code, then you will have yeah. to create an input and an outputs folder. And then outside of that, like add the code on Mermaid. Uh, sorry, gosh, on Jupyter Notebook, or you can run the uh, actual py, py file because it's it has the same functionality. Um, so yeah, it, everything is nice. here, but how it looks like when you're going to run it, it's that you open up Jupyter Notebook, and then you need to make sure that you have installed uh, extra libraries. When you get an installation of Python, depending on the version that you have, Pandas should already come installed. Very old versions, I yeah. think you would have to install them apart, like separately. Correct. You can do that with Conda, yeah. um, or also like with running like a pip install um, command. You need the yeah. Tableau document API, definitely. And this last one on the Excel generator is just one extra module that I wrote, um, which you can just download also from the GitHub. And then how the code looks like when we're going to run it is that on the inputs, Let's use a very cool um, workbook that was created by Will Sutton. And I really oh, like yeah. the that he added to this one. So the moots of mid, mid, I don't know how to pronounce it. Midgar, 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 Midgar. Oh, the moots of Midgar, yeah. I have no idea what Midgar is. I think is. it's Midgar. I don't know. Is it a town? Is it a person? The moods of Midgar. I think it's um, Final Fantasy character, potentially. Okay. So the way I that think. he created this is that if you click on any character, then bearing oh, in mind see. the interactivity that didn't show because the computer can't load it, but <laughs> all the different bubbles are meant to change um, oh, I see. positions. And he's doing that with like some parameter actions 
I think, um, and then just like some calculations that he also created on top of that. So, and this is, for example, one case, one use case of how I can use my code. It's like, if I want to understand how a workbook was built and how the different calculations fit into each other, because like, I wanted to recreate this, but for me to do it, I would have to go and then start looking at the workbook and see, okay, this calculation is fitting from what, and how is this working? And why does this look like that? So I just- And you'd miss something as well, yeah. Sorry? You'd miss something as well if you did it manually. You wouldn't get yeah. you wouldn't get the full picture immediately. It would take you a while, a lot of trial and error to actually get to the final thing. So the way I would normally just do this is into the inputs folder, I'd add the workbook I want to analyze. And then I go into the Jupyter notebook and then I run everything. It should take, depending on the mood of my computer, 10 seconds or well, 10 <laughs> seconds, which is great. And then it's going to open up, um, in this case, open up the Excel. Oh, it opens it for you. Which nice. then spits it as a PDF. It closes the Excel, <laughs> it closes the PDF. But if we now go into the outputs folder, then we have the Moods of Midgar um, calculations. And then it also creates an HTML file where the mermaid diagram is added to, and then it just opens up in the browser. So from here, we can see that it's mainly the target order and the source uh, default fields that Will was using yeah. to create different um, calculations that then were impacting the X and the Y uh, coordinates that were like then changing because character select, I believe, I think it was a parameter. So this character select was also um, influencing if you, it might not be completely clear now, but if you see there's this arrow from the character select going into X. Yeah, um, it's X, yeah. And there should be another one going and this to- this looks like a parameter. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, like you, if you select a different uh, character, then it will also change the origins. And then that was also gonna change the X and Y coordinates. So basically that's why we see, oops, let's go to the other one. The propagated, the, um, yeah. Yeah, then once you select um, anything here that I guess is a parameter action, which is changing the parameter value, and then it's changing everything in the calculation, and then the X and Ys are changing, um, yeah, coordinates, and then everything is moving. And Amazing. if we wanted to see... That makes a ton of sense. Now, because I went through, like, all the steps, and I was like, okay, I think this is doing this, and this is doing that, but, well, now if we want to see, like, what the actual calculations are, Oops, sorry. especially for like the character origin um, that we saw in the diagram, like I'm character PDF, origin, uh... X and Y, they actually depend on the selection of that parameter. Then for example, character yeah. origin Y will already have some hard coded values for like where everything is gonna load every time you open that workbook. And then depending on what you selected for that parameter, then everything else is gonna change. Um, and then that's why all the bubbles keep moving yeah good it does make it very easy to you know get to the bottom of what's going on and um, again even if you don't necessarily need this for yourself it's really good for documenting it for others like just imagine this is like a staple part of developers workflow if someone comes up in you know three months and says hey but there's this calculation it's broken it's wrong what is it doing this just means you don't have to open the workbook, go find it, go download it. You know, you've just, you could just keep all of these and just be able to reference them quickly as documents rather than having to open up your workbook. To then open a calculation only to realize you forgot all the other nested calculations in it. You know, like it's just like a big, big tail of um, effort that you've sort of solved nicely here. So it's really good. Thank you. Amazing. To be fair, I really like my code. I think I'm biased because I made it. <laughs> <laughs> but I just like your own baby. <laughs> it is my baby and I, I find it to be so useful and I personally I just want to share it like because you know like the open source community has like provided already so many tools. I just want people to use it and to know it exists. Um some people have asked me if I'm selling it or why haven't I started selling it. And at the moment like I didn't do it for any like profit. I just did it because I really needed it for myself and then I realized this yeah. is actually a good thing that could help others and I like helping others. So there we go. Good. If I need to get anything good. out of this, I just like the recognition. People to use it. And uh, 
Yeah, put 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 your name on it or get Anna in to talk about it. Exactly, and that's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. That's really good. I, I like it. It's again I'll emphasize this again. It's a very straightforward tool. It's really simple. It does exactly what it says in the tin. And to be honest with you, it doesn't need to do much more, right? Like yes, you've got iterations coming, but those are those are finesses of the general idea, right? Um, you adding things to this rather than like building a whole new capability. And even if you do build something new, likelihood is it will be focused because you know you've kind of got you've gone about this in that in that way. So yeah, I was just quickly. That's been really cool. Thank you. The last bit I was going to show you, which I don't know if I have it anymore, but okay, so never mind. No worries. I think we're done. Sorry. <laughs> because of um the the five the five chart limit right um, yeah no but what I was gonna say is uh when the first time I analyzed uh, Will's diagram and it gave me this bit like if you if you get all that code so if you get the mermaid code and you put it into mm -hmm. the diagram like the mermaid editor for free then you can also mm -hmm. get some of the lines to adjust more nicely or just like you can oh, get it to I see. look more even a bit more professional than this so it's easier to read. Yeah, that makes sense. That's actually quite a good tip if someone then decides to take this into something more serious, yeah. um, rather than spending a ton of time formatting. Yeah, you could you could go and just do it in that in that tool, and it's applied already. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, this has been uh, pretty incredible. Um, I like it. Um, I wish I had this what like nine, ten years ago when I was using Tableau. <laughs> um, funnily enough, though. This is one of those tools, a good example, one of those tools where it's never too late because you can go back to those workbooks, however old they are, bring them into this, and now you'll finally be able to have the thing you said you wished you'd created back then. This is the kind of thing that everyone says, yeah, I'm going to document everything perfectly in my little Excel. You do that for about a week and then you forget and then it starts to fall apart and then things get busy and then you just don't do it anymore. You never have the time. <laughs> it's like, and also, exactly. even if you did, why not just like spend it going out for a walk with your dog Doing and something someone new. else can, well, if a dog yeah. can do it for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good. Well, um, we have a tradition on the show and I've done something bad, which is I haven't remembered what Kirk Monroe asked in his last uh, interview with me. So I don't have a question to ask you just yet, but what I might do is I might send it to you once, once I know what it is. And if you're able to just maybe do a very brief recording on your phone or whatever, just responding to it. I think that's how we can sort of fill that in. And I'll put it in this space now, Tim, if you're editing this put it in here okay Tim here I'm editing this and yeah unfortunately I forgot to ask uh, Anna this question during the interview essentially what had happened is I'd, I'd had a conversation with Kirk Monroe and it had been some time before I had the conversation with Anna but I hadn't edited the episode so I didn't actually have the question to hand so I've inserted it here hi team how are you so uh, to reply to the question on what analytics tool I would create if I could create anything um, hmm. well, that was a hard one because anything is just very open, but I guess I would go for something along the lines of renting. So, because over the time that I lived in London, I had to rent in a couple of places and faced, um, very, I don't want to say difficult, but I'd say, um, yeah, very different landlords and landladies, um, yeah, so I think it would be great if this would be possible um, to have a public database and I know GDPR issues might spring up. So maybe let's forget about like naming an actual landlord. But if we could have a database for all the properties that go up for re uh, private rentals in London and we could get a history of how well they have um, been to like how how good have they been to tenants before how many tenant issues they've had before how good have they the owners have been with repairs uh also link that to the agencies um that have run the different um properties because sometimes it can be like a private uh, landlord or can be via a an agency and so if we could have an analytics tool or a dashboard that would give us an overview of all the different 
metrics on how good is a property to rent in in the sense of like are you going to have a happy stay while you're there um maybe probably if we can also have like updated uh, data about the neighbors about the borough about the council tax about um, how responsive the agencies are that would be definitely a really really nice thing to have um, so that you don't get any surprises down the line whilst you have already started your tenancy I don't know if that fits the criteria of uh, an analytics tool because I maybe haven't really described the tool more like I, I might just more like describe the use case instead, but there should definitely be something along the lines of that so that people can have like a very quick overview of where they're getting into. Um, and yeah, so like once you build that, you can add all sorts of metrics that you see that are going to be um, useful for private um, tenants. And also it can like help, well, I don't, yeah, it would help private tenants more than private landlords because or agencies but if we could also have within a dashboard just a little section or a section about agencies and within the agencies if you could also have them by borough and or by location because like for example you can have big agencies um that have lots of different branches and sometimes one of those branches can be good and then the others can be horrendous to tenants so something that helps bring like raise awareness and also like gives you the data and makes the data work for you okay hope that helps and um, yeah sending you this see ya hey okay so i listened to my previous message and i would just add to what i said before that if we could also have a sort of uh database on all the price changes that we've had on a given property and also on a given borrow and then you've got uh, more metrics that you can show on your analytics tool um, because then yeah you can show like um, rental prices over time and then it can also like help negotiate if you're going for some property that you want to put an offer on um, it just gives you a good idea of like how much you should be spending on it or maybe you would even like maybe that an analytics tool can help you find similar properties on a similar price range um but just in a different place or maybe just like some blocks or some meters down from it from where you're planning to rent i don't know but yeah like definitely including price prices um and trends over time could also help okay thanks for that anna now back to the video uh, and then we can figure that out. But it does leave me with an opportunity for you to ask the next guest a question. And I typically answer this question today and the guest, the next guest will answer it, you know, uh, when, whenever that is. I don't know who the next guest is. Typically, I do know, but today I don't know because, yeah, uh, baby and all. <laughs> so I know that with, this is like a Tableau um, channel, but I'm just going to go a bit out of that and say go, like, go a bit rogue yeah if you didn't have to work for a living what yeah. would you do oh that's a great question if i didn't have to work for a living what would i do the first thing that comes out of that this is kind of secretly two questions that's why it's a really good question because what you're also kind of asking is if you didn't have to work for a living would you still work in analytics basic that's actually that's like a that's little that's the secret question behind this and i think for me the answer is i wouldn't work in analytics if i didn't have to work i wouldn't work in analytics because i think i enjoy analytics as my career but i enjoy so many other things as my hobbies so if i didn't have to work that means i wouldn't have a career and therefore analytics wouldn't wouldn't be that thing like I wouldn't turn, let's say, my hobbies into a career either, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, that that's sort of a very clear idea. But what would I do? What would I do if I didn't have to work? What <laughs> it's would I tough do? One. I think there is the obvious one, which is yeah, spend some more time with families and friends. That to me goes without saying. Like there's no amount, there's no, there's no shortage of time you could spend with the people that mean something to you. So that makes a ton of sense. Um, but I feel like that's a get out of jail free card. So I think I'll answer this by probably saying, if I didn't have to work for a living, the thing I would do 
is spend more time in creative disciplines. That's not to say in the same way as my hobbies, but creative disciplines are, for example, um, learning how to draw, uh, learning how to create certain types of content, um, learning how to put together new things that you've never put together before, right? Because I think that time that would un you'd unlock would give you the space to, yeah, go spend the seven hours learning how to draw a perfect circle freehand, right? Like, like that is something you can actually do, but you need the time, you need to go watch the course content, you need to spend time seeing stuff. Learning how to draw is a really good one as well. Like everyone can draw to a certain extent, you just need to spend time practicing it to unlock the skill and, you know, get your muscle memories good. Um, I play more piano, like I used to play piano when I was younger and I just stopped and I now I'm sort of uh, discovering piano again, at least in my head. I keep watching videos about pianos and I keep thinking, I'm going to buy that piano. I haven't bought one yet, so <laughs> maybe it will never happen. But I think I'd spend more time in the creative disciplines if, if I didn't have to work. Get that piano. Because I think, <laughs> yeah, get the piano uh, um, and maybe some other instruments for, for other people to play along. I'd be in a jazz band. That's 100% what I'd do. I think that's what I'd do. That is like, if I synthesize everything I've just said, I'd just go be in a jazz band. Like, play the piano, do crazy stuff on, you know, when I'm not in a gig, and then go to gigs and meet new people, right? That's uh, uh, that's a great thing. I don't know if that's an idealistic thing in my head, or, or it's actually what I'd do, but yeah. Creative disciplines, go play some jazz. <laughs> nice. Okay. I'll just say go and get that piano, and then maybe even like your kids, yes. you've got three kids now, so they might take you yeah, up, exactly. and then you might just see them, <laughs> and you'll be like, oh, I want to teach you this, or just teach me, and then you'll get inspired, and then yeah, just get it. This is how these things work, right? Like you, you they snowball from one to the next. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Amazing. What would you do? I'll throw the question back to you, potentially. <laughs> oh, man. I would... <laughs> well, so I'm into painting watercolours um, in my yeah. spare time. I play table yeah. tennis. I'd actually... So this oh. might sound cheesy, but so I really enjoy like taking care of the elderly, so I just volunteer. Well, that's what I enjoy, volunteering. Yeah. So I'd probably just go to, like, you know, like we have like H U K, um, yeah. And yeah, I'll I'll try and volunteer my time with the elderly. Uh, again, like just you said, like seeing friends and family just goes without saying. I go to the beach. I would read a lot. Um, spend some time in nature. Sleep loads, and then I have this crazy idea of getting like starting my own cattery and my own sort of doggery, <laughs> and then. I've already spoken about this with a friend this week. I would take my cats and dogs to the elderly so they can also spend some time with them because you know like how cute puppies and kittens are and then just bring joy to everyone. And it sounds all cheesy, but to me, it's all about just like spreading the joy. There we go. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, you're probably looking at a QR code because my camera ran out of... Um... What what it is? I think the camera is too hot, so it's decided to just kill the camera. It's uh, it's not that it's not run out of battery, but Catherine Doggery, I'd be right there. That's like one of the things I'd definitely um, uh, I'd I'd go to. I, I have a dog. He's called Toby. So I'm a I'm a dog person. Um, a Catherine and a Doggery. Would you would you have them in the same building? Would you only get cats and dogs that are used to living with each other, or would you? have them separate <laughs> i haven't really thought about the logistics that much but they would be small dogs <laughs> they would definitely be small dogs so i can keep more of them in the same place uh, fine that's a good that's a good logic <laughs> toby would probably be three of those dogs if he because he's a large dog he's not a small dog at all so he needs his own room rather than like uh and they need his to own run <laughs> a lot and everything is, yeah, oh my yeah. gosh tell me about it yeah i'm you know uh toby's eight years old i've had him since he was a puppy and i think i've aged faster because just keeping up with him is just ridiculous like he's a he's a hungarian visa he's a hunting dog so they're also very like um driven and motivated and um super what's the word um very naughty, but not in a bad way. They're just mischievous. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> okay, I think I'm like Toby then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what my husband always says, and everyone that knows me says so. Yeah. <laughs> 
Amazing, amazing. Okay, uh, Anna, listen, thank you so much. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you for walking through it all. Um, if people want to download it, obviously they can go to GitHub and uh, start playing with it. I'll put a link to that in the video. Um, do you have a blog? Uh, do you have a Twitter? Is there anything you'd like to tell people to go to if they want to reach out to you, if that I makes sense? I do have a blog, which I should update maybe a bit more, um, but it's basically Anna Milana. After so this, after you've Milana. published this. I did publish oh, a here we go. version yeah. of the original Getting All the Calculated Fields from a Tableau workbook, which had the XML, um, like the bit that I said about like unzipping the TWBX file, and it just shows you how to yeah. go through that. But then at the beginning, I added an update, and that's where uh, you have the Python code because it links to my GitHub page. So, yeah. Perfect, yeah. perfect. Just go there, Anna Milana. Yeah. Milana Good. is my so... like pseudonym because when I used to work in finance, it was just easier to have a pseudonym rather than... Right, okay. This is actually quite a common thing. I'll maybe chat to you offline about this because I noticed this working for... A... Uh, consulting for a few companies that a lot of people have pseudonyms and the problem is that the email they get um for their what do you call it their their actual pr professional email doesn't match their pseudonym right <laughs> so you have like an email title which will have blah, blah 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 and then they'll sign off as someone completely different and i'm like is this the same person <laughs> That's a very, very good point. I guess it threw people off a lot when I signed myself as Pedro. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. I, I, I never get it. And I, I, like, I feel like um, corporate IT systems should allow for you to add pseudonyms and have multiple emails that come to you regardless, right? Like, it's just, it's, as you said earlier, it's the 21st century. You can create, like, alias emails that go to your email, right? And they, they should all work. But anyway, we digress. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for showing us what you've built. Um, yeah, and uh, we will chat soon. Thank you for having me. Say hi to... Okay, <laughs> you can just edit this out, but say hi to your wife and the little kid, Estelle. <laughs> 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 no, absolutely, absolutely. If 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 um, she was more settled, I would have just had her in a baby carry here or something like that. So <laughs> she's that small at the moment. Um, it's, it's kind of weird how small they are. Really, I forget. You just forget how small children, like newborns, actually are until they appear and they're only that small for like literally a month. They grow super and then a month fast. later, they're just yeah, yeah, yeah. They like, grow yeah, exactly. super fast. So yeah, yeah. I know. This this week and next week is like as small as she'll ever be and. And, you know, she's our last child as well. So, like, I need to cherish these next few weeks and just keep holding You don't know that. You might have some surprises <laughs> down the line. Uh, no, I'm fairly certain. I'm fairly certain. We've, we've got three already and a dog. I mean, if I, if I have another kid, I have to go buy a new car and, <laughs> like, move. And, like, that's... <laughs> So all these things are just, the economies of scale fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, for lots of good reasons. Um, and we have our hands full. We've got um, three kids to sort of look after, which is in itself and your becomes job, crowd control. And you have this, like, your YouTube job, channel, and, YouTube, and you've got and, everything. Yeah. So I actually these small things. <laughs> the amount of, like, discipline and work that goes into everything. And also, I guess, like, editing also takes a lot of time. And just, like, people usually oh, don't yeah. see that part. But so you're doing yeah. absolutely great and, like, you're admirable. <laughs> no, editing has made easier more recently. Like, it's funny because technology has gotten very good. Even what we're recording in today, Riverside, has made my editing job a lot easier. So um, I actually prefer these long conversations. I think they're easier to edit because it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. People are happy to, like, listen to more. But if you have to do, like, shorter, more, like, boom, boom, boom videos, then you have to, like, plan them a lot more ahead of time. I, t I tend to not plan them. I tend to do three or four. Then I the fifth one is probably the good one, and I keep the fifth one because it's just faster than planning them, um, if that makes sense. So inside baseball, how do you record a video? You don't plan it. You record it multiple times until you get it right. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> it's a bad way to do it. Bad way to do it. I can hear lots of YouTubers crying inside going, Tim, have you heard of a teleprompter? And I'll say, yes, I freaking hate them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Anyway, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll stop the recording here. Thank you, Anna, for joining me. Um, yeah, we'll chat soon. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a good evening. And you.